Oh my god, does it work now? Oh, all right. What's up, Pumpty? No, I can't hear you. You speaking? I think the space is bugged. I couldn't unmute earlier. It was giving me the flipper. And then I couldn't get back in. I couldn't get on. Oh, Humpty's off now, too. Let's see. Let's see if Humpty can get back up here. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Testing? Yeah, all right, cool. Man, bugs <laughs> oh today, huh? Gosh. Double bugs. That was the longest it's taken to get this um, technology to work, man. Jeez. Dude, I was like, I couldn't unmute my mic at first. It was giving me the flipper. And then uh, I kept trying to rejoin, and it kept on saying I was already co-host, and then giving me the opportunity to bring myself up as a speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is weird, man. I've never seen Wait, what? It was giving you the flipper? Like... It was flipping you off. Yeah, when you like, what does when you mean? try to unmute, no, when, when you unmute and it unmutes for just a split second, and as soon as you lift your thumb up, it mutes you again. So every time you hit the mute button, it, you're not actually ever unmuted. Oh man, so strange. Well, Jim, everyone, and uh, glad to have finally figured out, I guess, for the moment, some of the bugs um, that sometimes happen on spaces, but. Um, yeah, let's get this started. I, actually, I see some friends in the audience. Feel free to raise your hand. Um, I'm tuning in from my desktop, so I can't see if you're raising your hands. I can't see if you're asking to speak, so I've made Donnie a co-host. I'll keep eyeballs on it. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, I see friends in the audience, obviously Crypto Sapiens. Uh, I see Danny. So if y'all want to come up here and jam, uh, please do. Love to hear what y'all are doing today. As usual, this space is, uh, at least most times, this space is pretty open and we kind of discover the topic along the way. And then we kind of just jam on that for a little bit and move on if we absolutely need to. So with that said, I see Polaris joining us. So I don't know if he's asking to speak, but if he is, let's bring him up. Um, Donnie, how's your week going? We're on Thursday now. How's your big, your week been, I suppose? I think it's been pretty good. I, as usual, just kind of a, like a flurry of a lot of different things going on. I've been talking a bunch with a company that's trying to launch a DI or an SS, like a self-sovereign um, ID company that incorporates AI tech. And I'm still trying to figure out what that's all about. Sounds like it's going to be mobile app based. And I'm uh, just poking around that. And I launched a charity auction, the first of 59 of them to occur over the next two years. And uh, the, chari the, the auctions are of pieces that I drew, and all of the proceeds go 90% to Ordinals and Bitcoin core development funds. So really excited to see if that takes off or if we can raise some money for some, some cool causes. Other than that, I don't know, the usual just bar, bar stuff, I guess. How about you? Um, yeah, doing pretty good. I mean, I'd love to hear more about the uh, auctions. I'm, I'm on your... Uh, profile right now on your page and I'm seeing there uh, what it is that you're talking about. That's pretty rad. Uh, also, a uh, big fan of your swag. Uh, I love seeing the hats that you put out there. You sold out already. Like they're all gone. I, didn't sell <laughs> I just, I, I gave them, I basically allocated them to people I'll be bumping into at Art Basel. I only ordered 25 of them and I just put up a post saying, if I'm going to see you in Art, Art, Art Basel, uh, in Miami, just hit me up and I'll write the name on the inside of the hat and I'll make sure to get it to you. And people, like my DMs just got flooded right away. So I shipped a few out to friends and now we only have camouflage left. And uh, sorry about that, Humpty. I also don't wear camouflage typically. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I saw the colors and the coral really uh, looks beautiful. Um, but I don't know if I can pull off such a loud color and I I'll know see. definitely I wouldn't wear camos. So. I might have a coral left. If if I have it, I'll ship it out to you. I'll ask you for your address. Like I awesome. might know when I get home today, so it's possible. Yeah, it definitely looks like a very cool summer uh, hat. 
Some of that it is. I love the tone yeah. of those those Adams hats. They also have leather adjustable straps on the back. They're a really great hat, just in general. So no 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 low quality garbage here. You know that's it, right? Like if you're gonna make some swag, some merch, make sure that you're you're making something you'd wear. Um, too many times have we gone to a conference and the the swag is crap. Like I would say at this point, um, I have way too many conference shirts. Um, I use them all for, as pajamas. I don't wear them. Uh, usually not even at the conference. Dish rags. Uh, I'm not a big, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I use it to dry the car when I'm washing it. Um, yeah, it's like I don't, I don't normally wear logos. Like anybody who knows me, like I am logo less. Probably my sneakers uh, and hats are the only places where I have logos. And I always tell people, if you want to brand me, Give me a really good looking hat and that's probably going to get the most wear because you and I, Donnie, we know this. Uh, although you, probably better than I, uh, we're both bald, right? Like we shave our head. But you uh, you, you just put it out to the world. The, the, your head looks lovely. I get sunburnt uh, or frostbite. In other words, my head either gets really cold or really hot and so I normally wear a hat. So usually that's the best place to Well, there's no sun up here. On me. In upstate yeah. New York, so I don't have to worry about the sunburn part, but it does get cold, and I also, yeah, hats are like the the one movable item for me. Yeah, for sure. And and more recently, it's been socks. So if you have really good socks, also don't give me polyester socks because I don't want my feet sweating. Give me good old fashioned cotton socks, and I'll wear the heck out of those. Like I've been wearing tons of crypto socks, um, which is probably one of the few places where on my body where it's like pretty loud and colorful. Uh, most of my co- uh, clothes are more muted earth tones. I think anybody who's style. thinking hard about color design is using loud pieces as accents rather than the entire, like, I can't wear a shirt that's a noisy pattern. It just looks silly on me, but I could definitely pull off socks that are noisy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking down at my feet right now and, and they're loud, bright, mustard colored socks. And I love them because I put these on with my New Balance and definitely it's a nice winter color. Um, you know, I definitely look good against the New Balance uh, subdued colors uh, that I normally wear. So uh, definitely. All right. Cool. Uh, Polaris GM, man. Great to have you up here. How are you doing today? I mean, we'll spend the first 30 minutes of this call just talking about our day. Socks mostly. Yeah, man. Hello, <laughs> mostly, hello. Yeah, are you wearing socks, Polaris, or are you doing the beach thing and uh, not wearing any any socks or shoes? Um, actually, I was like uh, vibing on what she was saying, bro. I've been like, I've had a full socks overhaul, um, and uh, yeah, I've been like into my new cotton uh, patterns of socks. Is you know, I've got like quite a like twelve new pairs. Because I went down to Amsterdam and I found this place. They do like 100% cotton, organic cotton socks. And I just went uh, uh, crazy. And I, and I knew about the brand before as well because it was a Spanish brand. So apart from that, it's just been... Um, the, uh, it's, it's, it's quite cold up here in England as well. And, um, you know, just uh, kind of like preparing ourselves for the holiday season really and um looking at like i've been like working on with ai lately um i haven't been doing like stuff in terms of like a lot of uh, uh community stuff and and uh, like the way you and uh, donny have been smashing it but what i have been doing is i've been creating personalized gpts and uh, <laughs> Uh, Why are you laughing? That that sounds because, like a really wonderful task to have taken on. Bro, it's been amazing. I've been like making my, so I've got like a personalized tax tax GPT. I've got a personalized um, a psychotherapist. I've got uh, like a personalized, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, you, like, you know, like I've personalized a GPT just to like make the recipes for me in the way like you know the foods which are kind of like and Mm -hmm. then i've got a a personalized gpt to like select the songs for me and it's not like the way amazon music or apple music does it it's personalized to the like you know to all the all the levels you can get it personalized 
So I've been like really enjoying that lately. And I had the community call yesterday, so I was like talking about um, ETFs and the whole ETF Bitcoin ecosystem. So those were the highlights for me since the last time we spoke. That's rad, man. Well, two things on that. The first thing I'll say is I love to see just how accessible AI is becoming. Um, I have for some time been advocating uh, for AI to become as easy as using Photoshop. Uh, you know, people are, I guess, some, I won't say most because I haven't spoken to most people, but some people uh, that I've read online uh, talk about AI as a, as a negative thing in terms of its replacement uh, of humanity. Um, I think that at least uh, in the foreseeable future, I can't speak for infinity because I don't have that type of vision, but for the foreseeable future, I see it becoming a tool uh, that we can leverage uh, like any other tool uh, to either make our work better, uh, you know, to, to, to make it um, easier, simpler. Um, and yeah, this idea of like creating your own GPTs, right? Creating your own personal assistance. Let's just use language that's more accessible. Um, I think it's a wonderful way to go. And I love seeing the imagination uh, of people kind of going in terms of what they can do. I am a terrible cook. Um, I think I've said that here before. I burn water. Uh, don't ask me to cook for you because you'll probably get like charred something. It all looks the same color. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, I like the idea of being able to use your GPT to be able to create my own uh, delicious foods. Donnie is a wonderful tastemaker when it comes to music. He's shared his Spotify list with me, and it is probably one of the best lists um, that I that I listen to. Uh, for what for for everything that Donnie says about his like memory music thing, I, I'm calling BS because like uh, he's a wonderful tastemaker. He's curated the music beautifully. I would love to see a GPT that emulates Donnie's work and accelerates that, and just like takes his music taste to the masses. There is a Spotify AI DJ now that's, I forget what his name is, but it's something very like cringy hip, you know, his name's like DJ X or something like that. But he so far is not doing a great job of finding things that I haven't heard that I love, but just finds things that I wore out a while ago. So like, I think the accessible AI department for, for music thus far is pretty juvenile. And I would love to see that too, because it would take a lot of, <clears throat> I think, you know, my standpoint on techno optimism, because I wrote that article about it after the space that we talked about it on. And I think that AI is replacing <clears throat> human jobs that humans don't want to do. And it always has, well, technological advancements have always done that. It's, it's like the jobs that are difficult or dangerous or laborious or repetitive and don't require human ingenuity, but just require human process. That's what AI is beginning to replace. And it's starting to do a really good job of doing that. Um, I don't think it is where it will be clearly, but I would love to have, speaking of being replaced, I would love to have that task taken off my plate because as much fun as I have finding new music and listening to it, I would have just as much fun if I didn't have to find it and could just listen to it. And I could go divert my attention to something else that AI hasn't yet figured out how to expedite. So uh, yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah, and actually that touches a little bit on something that I was gonna also wanted to add. Um, wanted to keep it positive, but like I look, I always play devil's advocate, even with myself. I'll make a statement and then I'll argue with myself. So it's a pretty annoying trait of mine. Um, but as much as I love the idea of thinking about like AI as a tool, um, I like one of the things I like about humanity is its creativity, um, and I don't know if it should necessarily. Um, replace uh, some of the things that we find fun and do well. Uh, in, in, in this case, I guess I'll, I'll relate it to your uh, music curation. I, I, I think part of the reason why I enjoy um, the, the music selection uh, that, you've, that you've curated, Donnie, is because it, it comes from you. So I feel like there's something special about it in terms of like how you hear music and for me, listening to that playlist is almost like being able to sit inside your brain for a little bit and consume music the way that uh, that you would and uh, and try to at least get close to feeling it the way you might. And I think AI is just so, you know, sans emotion, um, no matter how much it tries to fake it. 
I, I, I really, really would not like to see that part of um, humanity be removed or replaced by AI. It seems to me that most of it is data driven. I mean, not, I don't mean most of AI, of course, AI is data driven, but I think a lot of human experience is data driven. And the big difference between what AI does and what we do is that we take in information through our five senses all day, every day. And we each remember different things about that because of the past context that we have. AI so far can only read written input, essentially, or, or ways that we have given it to possibly digest data. So its data can't possibly be as robust as human data yet. It can work a lot harder and faster, but it can't take in as much as we take in because we're sort of built specifically to take in a, a bunch, a diverse array of information so that we can survive as a species. As soon as it can smell and hear and feel sense like tactile sensations, uh, we don't stand a chance. And, but, I, but I agree that I don't think it should be replaced. Like a lot of the things should, maybe should isn't right the, the right word, a lot of the things that we do that we like doing, we can still do even if AI does them faster because we can still do them differently and better or the way we do. Uh, I don't know if there's a future where I'll still be alive where AI is gonna catch up to the point where human beings input is no longer somehow at least different than AI input. You know, yeah. it's uh, very interesting that the conversation is leading towards this direction because I was having this talk with my ex couple of my students who are like deep into like, you know, old school accountants and stuff like that. And we was talking about how experienced individuals who have got like uh, a vast amount of real life experience uh, when they're given this tool and the way these individuals use that tool um, uh, is not the same as a child, for example, who ends up getting hold of, um, you know, AI, which kind of like does all the tasks for that child. And as a result, that child misses out on a huge developmental aspects, which are crucial for that child's survival in a real, real world circumstance. So, yeah, I totally agree that there has to be like a, we need to create like a fine line between um, who, how, and what information can be accessible. Uh, it's like, for example, when I used to be in school, my teachers would make sure that I don't use the calculator and they would try to like, make me experience the whole process so that I know what the process is instead of actually just using things from the calculator. And then once you know the process, you can use the calculator. And and at university, I learned this from, from, uh, from one of my lecturers, which was that, like, you know, sometimes you just have to work smart, you know, and like working hard is not necessarily like a, like, uh, like you could work hard in a smart way. Let's put it this way. This is a better way of saying it. And 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 all that energy can be like you know uh, multiplied if you control if you control the processes. And I think this is where like AI like fits in as a professional who's got like you know all these different fronts uh, where I'm dealing with like lots of people. I'm supporting them. Um, and that's just like my personal opinion, of course, like or everyone's got their own uh, personalized uh, uh, point of view. But like from that, and then also there was another very interesting point that some of my students said that that like, you know, they haven't been to an, uh, to an actual live doctor. They've been having like inter uh, digital interactions with them. You know, prescriptions have been like given through digital interactions and stuff like that, and and all of these these uh, data points are like converging onto this perspective that you can utilize it, you know, to enhance your productivity. But there is a fine line between like utilizing it to enhance your productivity, uh, then like completely losing control over your neural capacity because you're relying on artificial neural capacity 
So um, yeah, that's a that's a huge topic to like you know ponder upon. And then if you if we talk about like control, then again, then what, when we talk about control, then then again, if it's like siphoned knowledge, then again we're back on to square one again. So <laughs> it's a, it's a crazy one. Yeah, one thing I wanted to uh, re respond initially to um, to Donnie and, and maybe also uh, with the context that you added there, Polaris. So I think I mentioned here before, I don't know if I did, but um, I went back to school, uh, started earlier this month in November. No, sorry, no, I started in October. So now we're on week three. Um, so I w I'm taking a class at MIT. Uh, to improve my knowledge of data, data science and AI, um, really how to accelerate data science with AI. And one of the first things we're learning is uh, how machine learning is able to emulate um, kind of the way that we would perceive data, right? So you were, Donna, you were talking about how, you know, much of our experience, uh, you know, is data around us and absolutely is true. Like colors are data, shapes and masses are data. Um, but, uh, so I think a lot of these things can be uh, broken down to, you know, numbers in a matrix, in a matrix where you're able to uh, start to create some sort of knowledge from that data. And machine learning can absolutely do that. One of the things, though, that I don't know how uh, yet, probably we'll find some sort of mathematic formula or some way of deconstructing emotion. Um, but I don't think yet that machine learning is able to um, kind of deduce reasoning or gain knowledge uh, or take emotion as an input. Uh, but that's just really interesting, right? Because I think for the most part, and I think uh, Polaris is something that you were saying, we are, you know, this is argument about nature versus nurture, right? We are uh, beings whose, you know, personality, uh, you know, are constructed based on our environment, sure, but also our upbringing, um, where culture plays a big role. And, you know, that's a much bigger topic, obviously, than we, we could cover here. But it's just interesting to consider uh, as we're having this conversation about uh, AI and potentially, uh, you know, kind of uh, replacing uh, some humanity level uh, contributions, um, you know, because it's the right now the barrier is emotion. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just very interesting also to see just the, the rate at which is accelerating. Um, and also, I think, allowing us to kind of reflect onto the world, some of our passions, interests, uh, skills. Uh, I'm seeing in the comments here, first uh, said, can you create a personalized martial art GPT? Like that to me, like when I think of Polaris, I think of martial arts, right? So it's really interesting to think that you could have like a personal trainer that is Polaris in a digital form based on the knowledge that you've uh, been able to accumulate and being able to share that as well for someone uh, in the future in, in some sort of virtual way. So, because I've been, I, I subscribe to like things like Peloton and, and the Nike app just to kind of try them out. And I can see how they're trying to convert some of those like in-person experiences in a digital format. I think this would be a really interesting thing because martial arts obviously has a bigger spiritual connection too that goes beyond just like, hey, just go run and, and get it over with. Did someone unmute and want to say something? Donnie? I, well, I hadn't unmuted yet, but I was just thinking while you were talking that I, I, think, I think I tend to boil down the human experience to something that's a lot more robotic and less. This space was downloaded via spacesdown.com. Visit to download your spaces today. Uh, mystical, I guess than most people where I don't even know if emotions really exist. I think it's a word for varying levels of self-preservation where like discomfort and pleasure are sought in order to make a decision that is best for the future of the species, as it were. So like, I don't know, I like being in love because usually being in love means we make more people. 
<laughs> like avoiding pain because usually avoiding pain means that we get to make more people because we don't lose limbs or get into discomfort somehow, you know? So like, I think that machine learning can absorb all of these things and it can have emotions without calling them emotions. It maybe doesn't experience them in quite the same way, or maybe it would somehow. Um, it's, it would actually probably be impossible to tell if it did because we can never be anything other than us. You know, can't, I don't even know if you experience emotions in the same way that I do, let alone a robot. Um, but I, I think that on a, on a base level, what emotions are and what they do can be replicated by machine learning and robots, which I know is kind of an unpopular opinion, but I think it falls into the same category of like fear of replacement by robots. And the, this, this part is like a fear of us being unimportant if robots can technically do the same thing or if we are robots just made of meat. Yeah, I'm sure someone is going to be, someone very smart or someone's very smart are gonna be able to like, create some sort of, you know, algorithm or formula that um, breaks down emotion into some of its uh, kind of more logical parts and then uh, be able to use that deconstructed emotion to train. I think I wrote, I'm sorry if I was just them. talking over, I can't hear Humpty. I'm going to go down come back. I hear you just fine. Can anybody else hear me? Polaris, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, just Donnie then. Oh, so weird. Um, I'm going to have to go and bring him back on uh, in a moment. So, Polaris, just uh, share your thoughts on that uh, while I have to walk to the next room to bring him up because I have two different devices running this show. Yeah, sure. Um, Donnie's back now. Donnie, can you hear us? One second, guys. Yeah. So one thing I've realized is um, the co-host thing, and I've actually, because not because we've experienced it, this seems to be the first time we're experiencing it. Whenever someone's a co-host, they seem to be the first to get rugged. Um, so Donnie, I've brought you back up, but I don't know. It still looks like you're a listener on my end. Polaris, uh, I made you a co-host, but I may have just rugged you by doing, <laughs> doing that. Maybe no one except the Ontology account should be a host. Can y'all hear me and talk? Yep, yep, I can. Right, so um, Donnie s seems to be a speaker in front of me, but then it seems to be requesting as well. When I oh my God. press I'm request... Back. I was oh, just yeah, a listener is. and had a mic button. Isn't that kind of funny? All right. Can you hear me? I can hear you just I'm not going to respond to the co-host prompt because I think Yo. every time I do that, it, it wigs out. <laughs> so now I got rugged right. and I just came back as well. <laughs> All right. We're good now. Yeah. No one's going to be a co-host No more co-hosts. Uh, everybody's just going to be a speaker. Um, screw that until, <laughs> until X can figure out how to uh, fix that because I know that's been an issue uh, in other spaces yeah, that I've that been uh, fun. a part of. What a roller coaster. Anyway, did you hear anything of what I said? Was I just talking to the wall or was I talking over people just now when I was talking about robots being people and people being robots? Yeah, we missed that. No, we could hear you. Well, I could hear oh, cool. you. Cool. Um, and I responded to it, but I don't think you could hear that. No, I missed that totally. Welcome to the Ontology Thursday Talks where everybody just tries to figure out if they can hear one another. Right, okay. Let's <laughs> We're going to edit let's that start out. start again. Donnie, I'm, <laughs> I didn't hear that, bro. Can you just like tell us about your thoughts on why... Yeah, yeah. I'll give you the short. The short is that I think that people are robots made of meat and that emotions are just our physical motivation to seek replication where pain, avoidance of pain, means that we get to make more people because we live longer. And... Uh, 
loving being in love and loving all the things that come with like partnership uh, also allows us to make more people. So I think they're just evolutionary inclinations, like programs essentially to keep us making more of us. And if we, like that's kind of all emotions are, is just preservation of species. We can make a computer do that. Hell, a computer can probably figure out how to do it itself. So well, let me know how to avoid pain, because uh, since I was a teenager and had a lot of accidents on a skateboard and snowboard, I am in perpetual pain. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm I not have, the person uh, for that back by any means. <laughs> That's an interesting um, concept uh, because when you look at it from a clinical pers perspective, it is at the end of the day just emotions which are like, you know, your DNA has information inside of it and when it's pressurized or it's placed under certain uh, conditions, then information kind of like comes out and that's the survival instinct which has been inside which has helped us survive and evolve and become the humans we are today so so for robots to like copy that i think like the aspect of spirit you know because that can't can't the the, the spirit aspect of the of the human that can't be uh you can't like you know have a a quantity associated to that and because of that i think uh, um the whole ai aspect can be replicated uh and because but the spirit in a lot of different uh, cultures and a lot of different uh, um human understandings um Spirit plays a very interesting role in 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 the human dynamics, and I think this is where the AI, uh, according to those laws and cultures and uh, understandings of 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 the human being, more than uh, a cluster of uh, softwares, and you know, like th that's where the whole thing becomes interesting. You know what's what's funny about that, and I've, I've had this debate with a lot of people, and I don't think anyone's ever going to know the actual answer to it. I don't, I don't think it's possible for us to know. But since we all disagree on what a spirit is or what a soul is or if there is a soul, it's not like we all disagree on what hydrogen is because hydrogen is measurable and we know it. Uh, spirit sounds to me like a word that is a fill in the blank for things we don't understand about ourselves and the world around us. And I don't know that that inherently makes those things not data it maybe just means we don't have the correct measuring devices for them. So like, again, I, I always default yeah. to this, like everything is data thing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. My son asked me this question today. He was like, dad, do you know about dark matter? And I was like, yeah, it's everything which we can't see. On yeah, blanket universe. term, right? You know, all the, all the stuff which you cannot see. So basically the stuff which binds the stuff which we can see is dark matter. So it's, not, it's what 98% of the universe is made out of. So, uh, yeah, I agree, bro. Uh, it's something which cannot be quantified. But yet, that not quantifiable attribute makes it quantifiable, <laughs> which is crazy. Man, y'all got me thinking um, about, about that word, right? Because I, I guess... There's several different ways you can contextualize spirit, right? Like you, I think that there is a religious view of spirit and spirituality. Um, I personal, personally, I should say, um, after having been, I guess, religious for some part of my life, um, have removed the spiritual, excuse me, the religiosity part from spirituality. Like I've separated the two, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And at this point, I would consider myself a spiritual person, though not a religious person. Um, but then it made me kind of question, well, what do I mean when I say that, right? And I guess by that is me um, accepting that there's a connection beyond the physical 
um, that can be experienced amongst um, a large group of people uh, or entities. Um, and that connects us at a much deeper level. Um, and so I think a lot of this could be, if you wanted to, and again, I'm thinking this through as I'm speaking, so I could be completely wrong, probably am, uh, but at least trying to make sense of it in my own mind, could be drawn parallels uh, as love being an emotion, but also a spiritual experience. And it's something that you can't necessarily draw, like physically draw, like uh, look at, but it's certainly something that you can experience. And it's something that can connect two people though love isn't necessarily just a duality, uh, to borrow some of the terms that you've used previously, Donnie, uh, but it's something that can, can connect, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands, or millions of people, too, in terms of like what love could mean as an emotion, but also as a spiritual thread, if you will. Yeah, I don't mean to say that like love doesn't matter or it's not important or any of that stuff, or that we don't experience it as something that is like profound, because I think we do. I just mean to say that when we attribute these blanket terms to explain the unexplainable. I think maybe we just don't have the vocabulary yet to explain these things. And I think I, I, I talk about this specifically with my wife a lot when she comes home from work and she's like upset about something that maybe she had some part in creating, you know, like I, cause I do this, everybody does this. Everybody gets caught up in some moment, like the, the self-preservation gets the best of us. And then we make a decision that's kind of counter what we really want to be doing. And I always talk about like how I try to bring up rather that her experience of this is real and true and it and it's not to be invalidated, but there is another perspective to check out. Um, and that's the, like the reality of the situation that like there are pieces of this that could have been handled differently despite how she feels about it. Um, so I, it, I would like to take that route here or at least plead my case that I'm not arguing that these things are not important or that we don't experience them as something ethereal that's like unnameably powerful. Just that if AI were to be programmed to respond in a way that was emotional, I bet it could because it's ultimately, whether right or wrong or effective or not, it's about preservation and replication somehow, you know? So again, not trying to downplay it. I think it's really cool. Yeah. It's amazing stuff and I feel it. No, I didn't take it, I didn't take it like that, man. Um, I was, again, trying to respond to something you said in context to, of course, the conversation that we're having um, in terms of like how, I guess, in, in, in the, the most recent kind of thing that I said, contextualizing it from my personal experience and my understanding of emotion and spirituality and how these things um, kind of live in an in, in almost intangible uh, kind of space. Uh, but Absolutely. I mean, I think that there could be ways, and I think I said that at the very beginning, where smart persons can come up with a way of like um, creating some sort of like algorithm that replicates it, but doesn't necessarily, or imitates it, but doesn't necessarily replicate it. If right. That makes sense. Right. The experience of it maybe is not replicated quite the same. Just the way that it looks from the outside could be the same. You know, the response mechanisms. Right. Absolutely. This has been rad. We've been we've been at this for uh, maybe not all forty six minutes because I think about fifteen minutes of it we've been trying to figure out our technology. Still feels like <laughs> it's been five minutes. Been... <laughs> oh goodness, yeah. This has been a fun so, one. I um, I'm sorry. Go not, ahead. It's not that hard, you know, like creating those personalized experiences with AI. This is what I realized. Like, you just need to have an ex the correct exposure and the experience to be able to relate towards what exactly do you need and want from that technology. And then once you have a clear understanding, you can create extremely uh, versatile experiences, personalized artificial intelligence experiences, which can enhance your overall productivity. It's not that hard. Even like getting Donnie's algorithm like, you know, if we can get, like, Donnie's 50 songs uh, and if I can, like, give the correct instructions to AI, AI to, like, break all of these songs down to, like, you know, 
to the smallest part and try to find like and then find common anomalies between those smallest parts and then try to relate those common anomalies with all the other parts of the song and then try to relate that with some sort of personality traits and then create a playlist which has got all of that and then also like check the beats per minute like you know what what's the ratio of which songs having which beats per minute and then like you know create a list of all of that and then and then divide them into like four different moods you know and then before you know it and then and then play the songs and then give it the final instruction that play the songs which are which 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 are not part of those 50 songs and then suddenly before you know it you're like listening to music you know which you never would have encountered in your life but it's guaranteed to like hit all your neurons and it's going to it's, it's guaranteed to like you know make you feel like uh, you know the, the the experience you're like trying to to have that's pretty unique humpty you know that's something which was not capable we were not as as a race capable of doing like 3 4 years ago and um, I think like great things can come from this, like, you know, the new generation, like my kids, for example, given this technology and then let them brainstorm over it. I think the new apps of this era, like, you know, the way we use Twitter and like X and all of these different apps on our phones, I think the next era of these are going to be personalized artificial intelligence experiences. And it's making more and more sense now why why it's going to happen and that's why i think like a couple last week there was a something which got launched i'm not sure what it's called i forgot the name of it but it's just like a little speaker which you've got on your t-shirt and it's creating ad hoc internal personalized ai experiences and then from those personalized ai experiences you're moving the your show forward basically and it's taking the whole phone interaction thing to to a completely different level. So um, so it's really interesting to talk about these ideas here because like I don't think there's many platforms which would be brainstorming about like these concepts. Uh, and we usually tend to be like six seven months in advance when we talk about them these concepts on our spaces. It'll be nice to see how it develops. Yeah. You know, I think two things. One, I agree. I think the future of um, apps is highly customizable, uh, personalized experiences. I think that that's something that we've been trying to get closer to for some time. Um, we haven't necessarily uh, done that very well yet, but I think we are we're getting there. I think with the introduction of accessible tools like these GPT uh, apps um, and this won't be the last one, I promise you. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, opportunity in this space. The one thing, though, in terms of the example you gave in music, I think we ignore that emotion, the emotion that we're feeling uh, for that music that we listen to is actually something that we're applying hmm. to the experience. The music itself isn't giving us happiness we're applying happiness based on how we're choosing to understand that music. Cause I'll tell you that right now, I could hear the same song three or four different times. And if I'm in a different mental state, it'll make me feel differently each time. Um, to that point, uh, when you talk about like taking Donnie's playlist, just because we keep talking about that, um, we, when, when AI tries to replicate an emotion, the only thing it has to go by is a data point from our end on how we felt about that music. Unless that playlist is called happy, and the assumption is that everything in that playlist is meant to make us feel happy, <clears throat> that isn't going to necessarily reproduce or create a new playlist that makes me happy. The data point that would be useful, and again, I say this from someone who's studying machine learning, is if there were be like a like button, but that applies every single emotional state and adds context to what we were feeling or thinking or experiencing at the time when we heard it, so that the AI can then say, okay, 
based on this information, I can now create a playlist when you tell me, make me happy. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I think we end up with like, oh, how do we put this? We end up with things that we want to be binary and categorize, but everything is in grayscale or rainbow to us. So like, I, th I think maybe one of the main challenges we'll face is when we tell the AI to make me happy or put me in a happy place, it can't possibly know the context because we can't possibly convey it. I mean, yet anyway. So like, I think there's going to be a major disconnect between maybe the big disconnect at this point is conveying what actually we are looking for when we speak with AI, not its limited capabilities, but our limited methods of conveying those things. Yeah, I mean, we may be the uh, weaker, li the weak link in this whole experience is that we don't necessarily have the tools to communicate how we are feeling beyond uh, something uh, as arbitrary as our mouths that can show when we are happy or our faces, right? That's composed of all of these little muscles uh, that show when we're happy, sad, uh, angry, it's afraid, etc. Um, there's no other kind of way to like export <laughs> to use computer terminology, our emotional state, but Hey, who knows? Maybe that's what Neuralink is trying to do is there'll be some sort of like binary code that is going to be, uh, exported that says, this is what a happy state looks like in uh, real data, uh, for Humpty, for Donnie, for Polaris, who looks like we lost. <laughs> Par for the course. Maybe accepted the co-host invite. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, any final thoughts on that or anything else, Donna? You wanted to uh, to to talk about? I guess uh, if you wanted to hear a brief overview of the auction thing, then I'm happy to do that. If we save that for next time, that's totally fine. Um, no biggie either way. Yeah. I have nothing else on AI though. I think we've explored that. Yeah, we definitely talked about everything that we can about AI, that's for sure. <laughs> that's a joke, obviously, for anybody listening, going like, these guys, who do they think they are that they covered everything yeah. about AI? It's we a joke, it. everyone. That's it. There's nothing else to say. <laughs> yeah, come to us with uh, any other big, um, you know, uh, world-changing problems. We'll fix it in an hour. That's what we do here. All right. Anyways, all right. With five minutes to go, I think this is good. It's a good cutting off point. Um, Donnie, definitely uh, let's talk about how we can introduce the auction. Um, I don't just want to give you like five minutes. I don't think it's fair. I think we can definitely have a full conversation on that. And seeing as how you're going to be heading to Art Basel uh, pretty soon, and you're, this is kind of the whole thing you're ramping up to um, into the new year, I think we definitely want to give you the space to talk about it and explore that because I, I don't think that I necessarily have seen anything like what you've been building. So I think it's a wonderful experiment experience to talk about as well. Cool. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to do a 30 second intro right now and then we can catch up on it because sure. the auction's going to end tomorrow and oh, uh, sure. there won't be another yeah, do, thing. Go for it. And, yeah, it's a 24 hour auction, but there's going to be some sort of auction or raffle or sale or whatever every other week for two years. So it's a really long concept, but yeah, I'll, I'll give the, if we have 30 seconds, is that cool? Can I give a boiler? Yeah, go for it, man. Cool. Yeah. And I'm not pitching it because I don't know if anybody in here is a Bitcoin or ordinals person. So it's not necessarily like, it's conceptually interesting, I think. Yeah, um, we can I, say this space has been brought to you by Bitcoin. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, great, cool. Here we go. Hasn't everything, well, maybe we'll say that in the future. So in the context where I bumped my head on the ground and I can't remember anything other than right now, I can't think of individual items. So when I draw something and the current auction is for a piece that's called the flag, it's a flag. And the flag just says we from here and it's black and white and it's line drawing and there's no individual characteristics about it. It's kind of like as base layer as you can go while still being recognizably a flag. So while I, when I look at a, rather, when I think of the word flag, this is what comes out of my head is this bare bones, amorphous, detail-free thing. When anyone else hears the word flag, they think of a flag or a time where a flag was used or some sort of like memory context dependent item. And that's inextricable from their experience of the word flag. 
So I wanted to experience or uh, rather promote people reinscribing more data onto these things because you can do that with Bitcoin ordinals. Um, where I start with this base layer image and then everybody else adds on what they think of when they think of flag, because they can't think of something that's nothing. They have to mandatorily add their experience in because that's all they can draw from, where I don't have that ability. So I, I have 59 of these things left and I gave the first throw 11 or 12 out to artists and they've been passing them on and reinscribing them. The first one was a rat and it's gained a ton of traction. And I figure auctioning or raffling or something one of these every other week through the bull run or past euphoria is a good idea with the mandate that 90% of those funds go to ordinals or Bitcoin development funds right out the gate. So all of them will be going to 501c3s of some sort, adding to base layer development on Bitcoin or ordinals protocol, since it's a Bitcoin or ordinals thing specifically. So I'm just trying to see if anyone cares about that or if it picks up traction or if we can reroute a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million dollars worth of liquidity from the ordinals market or the just Bitcoin market in general into something that can foundationally bolster everything that we're finding valuable as we traverse this, you know, burgeoning landscape. Um, so we'll see if anybody buys it. I mean, it could sell for 10 bucks. It could sell for 10,000. And then we'll see how this picks up steam over the course of regular auctioning, you know? Yeah, 100%. So if anybody wants to check it out, uh, go to Donnie's uh, X account. Uh, it's it's Donnie OK. Um, and and obviously it was a joke. It's not brought, this space is not brought to you by Bitcoin, but we can say um, that if you're interested in learning about the growing Bitcoin ecosystem, um, this is ontology related. Go and check out Goshen. Goshen uh, recently made an announcement about its uh, Bitcoin EVM uh, and some of the developments that are happening there. So I've actually challenged the team. This is just what I do. I see a problem and I try to find a solution. One of the things that I challenge the team to do is as they are developing this Bitcoin EVM, uh, you know, with Goshen, let's make it easy for people to launch a contract on Bitcoin. And so on that Explorer, hopefully, maybe we'll see soon a smart contract deployer directly on there so that you can launch your first smart contract on Bitcoin, uh, in a, on Bitcoin EVM, I should say, uh, using Goshen. So I think that's really cool. I really love the idea of making, uh, you know, uh, technology accessible to people and making it super simple. And if there was a way to just deploy a smart contract through this uh, platform, I think that could bring a lot of value to the Bitcoin ecosystem too, because we're accelerating development on a very valuable piece of the ecosystem. So I have nothing else to add. Thank you so much to um, all of my co-hosts here, uh, Donnie, Polaris. Uh, sorry to everybody who was on the audience who kept, uh, we kept getting rugged. Uh, next time we just won't take the co-host uh, <laughs> uh, role here anymore because apparently that's not working. But um, yeah, thank you everyone. We'll see you again next week, same day. Oh no, probably not same day because next week it's Thanksgiving. So let's figure out what we're going to do so that we can still hold the space, but not on the same day, because uh, at least here in the U.S., we're going to be stuffing our faces full of turkey. OK, uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. And yeah, much love and have a great weekend. Adios, amigos. Thank you. This space was downloaded via spacesdown.com. Visit to download your spaces today.